This is a very special night. I want to acknowledge that we are on indigenous lands, the lands of the Yonwandat, the Seneca, the Onoshone, and it is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and the privilege that we have to continue to be here. This series of uh, having a filmmaker in residence at Massey College is designed to use the way documentaries bring to life stories of injustices and stories that require change, is to motivate all of us to continue to fight for change and to use the tools that can be uh, accessible through the power of the visual and the power of the words, the power of the arts. Many of the people at Massey College are in deep science. They are in law, they are in medicine. We have many artists as well that are there. And part of the mission is really to nourish learning, but serve the public good. And I think tonight we want to serve the public good and honor great filmmakers. And uh, so I want to thank you for being here. And I'm going to pass it to uh, our filmmaker in residence, Peter Raymond, who has been in the film business for many years, and he is hosting and catering and uh, this, this series to help us understand the power of film. Merci. Thank you. Miigwech. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, welcome to the, to the first uh, Filmmaker in Residence uh, film in, in this season. Uh, the, the purpose of this series is to uh, shine a light on, uh, on films and have discussions, films that have, that have moved the needle on public perception, on, on, on public events. And I think this film certainly uh, fulfills that uh, mission. Uh, we're, we're really honored and delighted to, to welcome here uh, Tasha Hubbard, who's the director of the film, and she's uh, from Edmonton. She uh, grew up in Saskatchewan, and she'll be up here after the film to, to discuss it with myself and her producer, her NFB producer, many producers, but her NFB producer is also here, uh, John Montes. So uh, the, the, in the Cree language, this is a difficult film for people like me to pronounce, but it's Nipawistamasowin. It's probably, I probably butchered that, but it means uh, we, a small group, will stand up for others. Uh, and Tasha's a very powerful film, as, as you'll see, tackles this uh, horrific miscarriage of justice uh, caused by systemic racism and, and discrimination suffered by indigenous people um, within Canada's legal system. The film o o opened the Hot Docs International Film Festival three years ago. It won the Best Canadian Feature Film Award. It won 10 other awards um, across the country including the prestigious Canadian Screen Award for Best Feature Documentary. So we'll watch the 98-minute the film, and then we'll have a, a discussion. Thank you all very much for coming. Thanks for having me. Hello? Test. Oh. Okay. Well, oof. this is Tasha Hubbard, the director of the film. <laughs> John Montes is the producer from the National Film Festival. Uh, we're 
we're very fortunate and, uh, oh, the mics are working. Thank you. So uh, fortunate and delighted that Natasha can be with us. She's here partly for the Imaginative Film Festival because she lives in Edmonton. So it's good, good timing, good fortune that she could be with us this evening. What a powerful, powerful film. I've seen it several times, but whew, every time I see it, it has such power. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just little introductions, and then we can do some questions, and questions from you, of course, are welcome. Thanks, Alyssa, for, uh, oh, closer to my mouth, <laughs> because this is being recorded, so we should use microphones. And we, we, when you ask questions, please use the microphone, because this is being recorded. Um, so Tasha uh, Hubbard is from the, uh, I'm, I'm sure I won't pronounce this properly, but you can try. Pipikisis, First Nation? Pretty close. Thank you. Uh, which is uh, in Treaty 4 territory, which is the, what we now call uh, Saskatchewan or Southern Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she has ties to the Thunderchild uh, First Nation in Treaty 6, which you saw in the film. And uh, Tasha is a professor at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, and her academic research is on Indigenous efforts to return the buffalo to the lands and on indigenous film production in North America. And uh, her first solo writing, directing project, which I watched again this afternoon, my God, Two Worlds Colliding, which is about the Saskatoon's infamous starlight tours where the police would take indigenous people out into the country and just leave them there to freeze. Uh, it premiered at Imaginative in 2004 and won the, Can the Canada Award at, uh, at, at the Gemini Awards. And another very powerful film exploring injustice in Saskatchewan's judicial system. And in 2016, she directed an NFB-produced feature documentary, Birth of a Family, about a 60s scoop family coming together for the first time during a holiday in Banff. And you're now in production on... Uh, an independently produced feature documentary, Singing Back the Buffalo, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, um, and John is a transplanted East Coaster from, the, from Newfoundland, who's uh, now an independent producer based here in Toronto, and for 10 years she worked at the National Film Board in uh, Winnipeg, Montreal, and Newfoundland. Um, works on a slate of documentary animation interactive projects about identity, culture, and social justice. So let me use my privilege up here to ask the first questions. And then, of course, uh, anyone who'd like to ask a, a question. I mean, this is a, a especially remarkable film as it braids together three uh, th uh, threads, the, the, the story of, of Bultish uh, horrific murder, and the history of settler indigenous relations, and your own personal history as a, a child of the 60s scoop where indigenous children were adopted out of their community. So when you started this project, was that your intention to tell three stories and braid them together? Well, my actual original intention um, was actually, uh, I was going to write um, a sort of a public piece, a blog piece, because I did think of those three things simultaneously. I, um, I learned because Jade is um, married to my cousin Lyle, who you see in the film. And so I had seen through social media about the death of Colton. I didn't know the exact details right away, um, but I knew enough that, you know, of course I felt grief for the family, grief for the mother, and, you know, and then I was, you know, dr like I say, driving, and we were, I, we were actually going to Thunderchild, and I had the boys in the back seat, and I was looking at them through the rear view mirror and crying and thinking about what this was going to mean for them. The swiftness in which Colton was murdered was just so shocking. And, you know, and then, because of my academic background, but also my dad's family, they're oral historians, and so I knew the history of that area, and I started to think about that, and I just thought, you know, this is another um, event in a long line of events that are all connected. 
And so I started to write about it. And, um, and then when we were on our way back to the city, um, we stopped at a little lake resort burger place and I let the boys go play and I was starting to write. I brought got my laptop out and I started thinking about these ideas and how to weave them together and and I looked over and the boys were nine at the time and they were playing with these two non-indigenous boys their age. And you know, in the way that nine year olds have like instant friends, that's what was happening. The four of them were just laughing and playing and having a good time. And I started thinking about how at their age, they haven't learned that yet. And then the boy's mother noticed who her children were playing with and she ran over and grabbed her boys and pulled them away. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, nope, they do learn at this age. And I started thinking about that. And then we were driving back and my dad called and said the funeral was today. You know, his wife was really upset. Could they come stay with me? And so, of course, all, all anyone was talking about was what had happened. And I said to them, well, I'm going to write this piece. And my dad and his wife <laughs> got annoyed at me. <laughs> They're like, you're a filmmaker. You should make a film about this. And my dad's wife said, I'll introduce you to Debbie and the family. And uh, so I said, OK. And I, I was just finishing Birth of a Family, actually. I was working on the fine cut, and but I called Bonnie Thompson at the NFB and, and told her my proximity to this and the access. And I said, I feel like I should do something. I don't know if it's a long form or if it's a short film we make and put it out right away. Like, I don't know at this point. And, um, you know, but pretty quickly we realized it was at least an hour. That's kind of, we actually intended it to be an hour long film, a broadcast hour. And it only turned into a feature after the um, verdict. But I real, you know, I had sat down with Bonnie and started talking about how to tell the story. And I had been pressured actually with Two Worlds Colliding to put my story in the film and resisted because it didn't, first of all, I hadn't presented that as my angle when I was meeting with the families of the deceased men in that film. And I was like, I'm not gonna feel good about coming back later and saying actually, now the film's also about me. Like it just didn't feel right. So I really resisted that pressure and didn't. Same with Birth of a Family because that had been my background. It, you know, it was suggested, am I going to be in the film? And I said, no. Partly because I knew I wanted to film that really observationally and I'm like, no, like this is their story. It's not mine. Like my experience helps me tell it, but it's not my story. And then with this one, because of, I think of that, you know, with, with my son and nephew, but also, you know, as I say in the film, I grew up on the farm until I was 11, and I spent the majority of my time when, with my grandpa. My grandpa and my, we spent a lot of time with my grandparents. My parents were always working. And, you know, we got taught how to shoot, and with so much care, so much respect, you know, we understood, like, as I think I was seven or eight when I first shot a gun and was taught how to do so safely, you know, and I can actually have a memory of, you know, getting into real trouble because we had pretend guns and I pointed the gun at my brother, like, cause we were playing, you know, a game and, and, oh, you know, I can remember like, you know, I was still kind of, you know, the 70s, right? You're getting shit, like you really got shit, right? <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry, I won't do that, right? But you know, so it was just like that was ingrained that, and it was just so then this event and the way it played out, it really brought home to me like, oh, things have changed. Like for the family, for Stanley's family to have, and, and the son had more guns. Like there were just guns everywhere on that property. You know, not stored safely, easily accessible. There were shell casings all over the farm. Like it was like, what is going on? Like where's that respect? So. That was sort of my first inkling that I could also use my positionality as having grown up with, with a farm family on a farm in rural area um, to kind of call attention to some of those things. So um, that's a very long answer to your well, very first question. Well, a good answer. I mean, I think that's what uh, is part of the great power of the film, obviously, is your own personal 
story woven through it. So thank you. Uh, one, one, one more question, from, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, we spoke about this a bit over dinner. Do you think this film was made, uh, what, six years ago? No, three years ago, sorry, three years ago. The, uh, do you think there's been any change uh, since in Saskatchewan? Do you think there's any better sense of justice for, for within the legal system for Indigenous people? No. <laughs> It'd be nice if I could say yes, but no. Um, you know, that, that culture of white supremacy is woven deeply into the fabric of, of, of the prairies and of Canada. So you don't undo that in, in a short time. I, I think that, you know, there was a real movement to protect the system, to protect, you know, and I, I, I told the story at, at dinner, one of the things I didn't put in the film Partly because, uh, you know, just structurally, how do we talk about a preliminary hearing and that you could get really caught up in the weeds of the legal system, but at the preliminary hearing, um, which was the year before, uh, I went as an observer, I didn't film, and um, there was a break and we all went outside and then I came back in and Debbie wasn't very far behind me and we, at the front of the courthouse was the defense lawyer, Stanley, the prosecutor, and the judge. And the f they were sitting, to standing together laughing and talking like it was coffee row. And I remember thinking, fuck, right? Like there's just this like network that is just so entrenched and Debbie, bless her, you know, called out to them, I'm glad you guys are having a good time, because I'm not. And, you know, they got embarrassed and they scuttled back to where they were supposed to be, and it was just like, you know, there were all these signs that, you know, this, this, there, there were going to be issues. And I, I mean, I think I felt that from the very beginning, the fear that this wasn't gonna go well. And the hope, you know, which is why Sheldon, Sheldon Whitney was never meant to be a character in the film. Um, I've known Sheldon a long time, and actually, this is how interwoven our relationships are in, in the prairies, we're out the creek. My grandmother helped raise his mother. Um, so I've known him a long time, and, and he was someone, you know, we'd talk about the case and stuff, but, you know, I saw in his public speeches that hope that, that people have that maybe this time, right? Because it's not like there hasn't been injustice before. It's not like there haven't been this, this pressure for things to change before. There has. And so you're like, okay, maybe this time, right? And then you feel kind of silly. And I think that's how, you know, honestly, I remember crying the night of the verdict, like sobbing to, to Bonnie. Because, um, I mean, you, you were there. We were there, but I, she wasn't there, and I was phoning her to let her know what happened. And I just said, I just feel so stupid. Like, you know, I feel so stupid that I had carried hope because, of course, this was how it was going to happen, right? And what I'm going to just say, I'll finish up, yeah. it hasn't changed. The, this, the essential, inherent factor hasn't changed. I will say I think it has resonated in the sense that, you know, you know the family and, and other myself are, st are in touch with other cases that have happened since that are similar. And what the families have said there is that it's like the prosecutors have taken notes and going, we better do a better job this time. Right. And there's been better communication. There's been more respect. I mean, the, prosecu the prosecutor's office has a lot to answer for, for. We focused on mostly the defense in the film, but because it was harder to sort of distill down the issues with the Crown, but there was a lot of issues with the Crown. And how about on the United Nations level? They, the family goes to the UN, makes their case. Has there been any, they ask for a, the, a, a UN sort of investigation or a report on the Canadian judicial system and how it treats Indigenous? Oh yeah, I mean, Canada responded right away and went, oh, everything's fine. <laughs> you, know? you know, I mean, that's the response, right? You, you know, any time that there is these things raised, then the system, you know, goes into self-protect mode, and, and that's what the Saskatchewan legal system did. I was saying at dinner, I gotta look up the title, because I tell this story and I get the title wrong every time, but the Attorney General had a 
workshop, or like gave a big talk about a month after they declined to appeal. And the title of his workshop was, or his talk was, Everything's Fine, basically. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like that. And you know that's sort of been the response. So he's still the person. I mean, the system is the same. Um, nothing came of the UN. Canada really didn't respond. Um, other than the peremptory challenge. And we felt at the time that, you know, the system expects, whenever we speak up, whenever we speak out, it's like, it's like I, I, I envision these circles and they're like, okay, what are we gonna give them to make them go home? And I feel the peremptory challenge was that. We're gonna, we're gonna give them this and then they're gonna go home. Mm -hmm. And we go back to normal. And um, you know that's something we've called them on, but it, it hasn't really meant, meant hasn't resulted in anything. What was it like working, John, with uh, with Tash on this project? Um, yeah, you know, working on this project obviously is a was a transformative uh, experience for me, and. You know, Tasha mentioned initially we were thinking that this would be a shorter film, that it would be an, an hour length film, because our thinking was that there would be a manslaughter verdict. And basically, at the point in this film, you know, that the verdict gets us to that TV hour mark. And in the voiceover, when Tasha says, in that moment, everything changed, for us too, everything changed. And we realized that the film that we thought we were making was very different from, than the one that we were being called forward to make. Um, there was a lot of learning, a lot of humility. Um, you know, on my side, as a producer, trying to support a creative team, uh, often under very stressful circumstances, things that are happening very fast, I think a role of a producer is to try and remove obstacles. And also, you know, um, how can I put it? Needing to also understand when my whiteness is an obstacle and needing to address that. And, you know, mistakes, but humility. And I feel so uh, privileged to have been given space in that circle and given space in that process. Um, but it was a very difficult film to, uh, to make, and I think, and not, not just in production, also in release, we ha there was a lot of care to be done. Uh, as you said, the film opened hot docs. We spoke a lot as a team, you know, what does it mean for the family to be in front of strangers, predominantly white strangers, you know, two big rooms at, uh, at Hot Docs and people witnessing them at their most vulnerable. Um, and that process of care is one that continued well into the launch. Well, thank, thank you and uh, for helping with the film board. I'm sure you did internally in your internal ways at the film board, <laughs> keeping the support going for this film and probably finding more money when it was needed partway through and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm, uh, I do want to say, you know, we had uh, a really extraordinary uh, production team. Uh, as Tasha mentioned, Bonnie Thompson uh, was a co-producer. Tasha, George Hoopka, who was uh, our DOP as well. Um, and David Christensen from the film board was our executive producer. And I want to shout out Janice to Janice Daw and Kathy Chavich Johnson, who were extraordinary supports throughout this process and really helped, you know, as you say, when you have to rejig that process halfway, you know, Kathy and Janice were really in our corner all the way through. Yeah. So thank you. So questions, uh, please use a microphone just so that it can be you can be heard on the recording. Uh, can we move the mic around, or you yeah. can you just come up to the mic, or whatever you want to do? But uh, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Wanja. I'm a journalist, and I'm from Kenya. 
and I'm very uh, privileged to have watched that film. I think that it's a very sad story that is very well told. You did a great job telling that story. I'm also uh, liking the fact that uh, we will stand up is a call to action. You speak to a lot of us when you tell that story. A lot of us who have uh, endured, uh, especially colonization, mm -hmm. and uh, what it has done to our people, you're privileged to have the platform to tell that story. So when you tell it, you speak for a lot of us, and for that I'm very grateful. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question would be, what does it take to produce a documentary like this one in terms of uh, cost? And the fact that you're very close to the family, to whose story you are telling, mm -hmm. how are you able to tell it objectively, also being part of that family? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, we, uh, when it came time to make the film, you know, I think, I mean, Birth of a Family was released in 2017 and, and did well, and that helped. You know, we, we had to, we had the film board support, but we also had to raise our money on our own with the, with the independent side. Um, and we were able, you know, to get a budget that we needed. I think we also had to, like, with, with the verdict, all of a sudden, you know, I think we had three days budgeted for the, po like, sort of the follow-up after what we thought was going to be manslaughter. And then, like, literally we're in a plane and, you know, George Hoopka, thank God, has, you know, good credit and put all our flights <laughs> on his credit card because we didn't have, that wasn't in the budget. Like, all of that wasn't there. And so then that was really where, you know, the team had to dig and find more money and, and, and the NFB was able to commit some more and we were able to find some more. And that's when Telefilm came in. So that's, you know, to get it, it, but it's not easy, you know, and I really feel grateful to have the team I have to, to, to pull together the budgets that are needed. Um, you know, I, I've thought a lot about the notion of objectivity and I, I think that, you know, it, it's really a false concept when it comes to, to films. I think that people hide behind what they think is objectivity, but it's actually, they're, they're very much representing their worldview. And if they happen to hold privilege and, and et cetera, then that's the worldview that they're privileging, but it's not objective, right? And I think that that's one of the tactics to make people, you know, indigenous people, you know, all around the world <laughs> go, okay, we have to, you know, be objective, which is really just replicating you know, a, a, you know a, a colonial view. So I don't believe that anyone can be objective. I think we all carry what we carry with us when we come into the storytelling sphere. And, but you know, but your point so well taken, it's a challenge too, right? <laughs> to like sort of find that, where that storytelling voice is going to be. And you know, one of the big concerns I had and we had throughout editing, Bonnie Thompson retired um, her last shoot with us was Ottawa, and um, and she's you know she looked at cuts and gave notes, but it was really you know John who st who stepped in um, to that uh, for the edit. Well, you were there for the production as well, but you know it was John and I and our and our editor trying to figure out the balance, you know, and that was something I was really worried about in the decision to include my own story, not ever wanting the family to feel that you know I was overshadowing and that my story was there to help people make sense of what was happening to them, right? Um, but I was able to say to the family very early on, I'm, I'm gonna do these three things. I'm gonna tell this history. I'm gonna follow what your family, and I'm gonna use my position as an adoptee to, to help, uh, you know. So they were really in support of that. Um, you know, I, th I think that there's probably those who critique the film or critique that process around, you know, because there's that notion of, I guess, maybe journalism, that objectivity is so, this val I don't believe in obje objectivity for <laughs> journalism either, but, you know, there's still that, that standard. Um, you know, that said, you know, how can I be a human being? How can I be a good human being, you know, in this process is, is always with me. So, you know, supporting the family the best I could. I mean, I also, I didn't, I also had to, you know, keep a half a step back. It's not, it's not a step back, but I had to do, uh, you know, keep that half a step back where I'm always looking at the big picture, um, you know. But 
they they are connected to me. I can't, and I so I thought, okay, I'm going to be transparent about it, and that was the you know locating myself, locating my relationship to them, um, and you know I think the film it 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 shows that care that we have for each other too, right? Um, you know. And I'll just say, the last thing I say is, you know, I, I asked Debbie once, like, I hope you feel okay with, with things. And she just, you know, and myself and the boys, and she goes, no, she goes, that's why we're doing this. Like, we're doing this film for your boys. We're doing this film for the children. Be it's too late for my boy. And she said, so we're putting this, we're doing all of this for them. So of course they're in the film, of course, and you know they're they're close to this day, you know Debbie and the boys, and we go visit, and um, you know we all feel a responsibility to them. Um, that I I think you know one of the things that irritates me about some documentary practice is the parachute model, you know where the filmmaker goes in, you know spends a few days, gets the story, and and you know. I've heard stories of subjects like, I don't even know what's happening with the film, nobody is calling me, because you know, they're there to extract the story, and we do, we, uh, you know, m filmmaking can be very extractive, it can replicate those colonial patterns, so I guess my practice is just trying to not follow, <laughs> not fall into that. And we, um, we did show the family cuts in progress, right? Um, you know, I think it's, I think that the, you know, the auteur model of filmmaking, sure, is appropriate in certain contexts, but in films like this where you are working with people, I think it's just absolute horseshit to think that you are the one with the most artistic and creative responsibility over the whole piece. You have a responsibility to the people that you're representing and to the stories that they have shared with you. Nobody had to do this film. Um, and bringing them into an edit process, and I'm not talking about, okay, should we hold on this for five seconds? Should we hold on it for six seconds? You know, I'm talking about how do you feel? Does this film, does this cut represent you? Are you comfortable with this? I think that that is necessary, you know? I don't think it's something that's just appropriate. I think that that is the only ethical choice that you can have in a situation like that. They used to teach at journalism school balance, fairness, and objectivity. Uh, <laughs> I never. We used uh, very little journalism in the film. This is not. We used yeah. very little. Well, uh, I, I, don't, I agree. I mean, objectivity doesn't really make any sense when you're a filmmaker, and it's impossible to be objective in, in, in this. Try to be fair, and maybe the broadcaster over the course of a season tries to be balanced, but uh, I think objectivity makes no sense. Do they still teach, Bernie, you're, you're, you, you teach journalism at, at, at Ryerson University. Oh, that's not called that anymore, I'm sorry. But uh, do they still teach balance, fairness, and objectivity? Oh, you don't have a microphone. Oh, you can use, here, use mine. It's not mine, it's yours. Um. My name is Bernie Luft. I, for 40 years, worked on a CBC radio program called Ideas. And uh, these discussions about objectivity, Tasha, I'm very much with you. It's not possible. Objectivity is a God's eye view of the world. None of us are gods. Uh, but we can represent things as best as we perceive them. Uh, I, I was surprised in the last few years that the issue of objectivity has come back into discussion because uh, at the CBC, the journalistic policy never mentioned the word objectivity. It mentioned fairness, it mentioned accuracy, a couple others that I forget, but objectivity is not in the, w and I think the fact that the word isn't in the CBC journalistic uh, policy book um, is a result of many years of discussion about whether that word was appropriate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in the most 
straightforward newscasts, what people sometimes say, we just want the facts. Well, the question is, which facts? There are a trillion facts in the world. And in a story, you're going to select six or five or eight. And there is not an objective mind, but there is a mind that's conditioned by experience, by culture, by upbringing, by personality to decide, well, this is important, this is not important. Mm -hmm. uh, so I taught in the media school after I left the CDC at, at uh, Ryerson, now at, uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, and the word objectivity never passed my lips. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Natalie, did you have a question? I, s I saw you were oh, approaching the microphone. Oh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much. Oh, sorry. D David has a question uh, uh, thank, thank before we so wrap. Much. Yeah, thank yes. you. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much. Um, um, I, needless to say, I find the film um, extraordinarily powerful, uh, necessary, and I'm, I'm with Wanja in feeling great privilege in being able to, to view this film. So thank you, first of all. Um, I thought one of the quietly powerful things in the film was your uh, role as a mother, um, the care and the teaching uh, that you offer throughout the film. And uh, I wonder um, if, you'd, if you'd be willing, uh, you may not be, but if you'd be willing to share um, um, how, your, how, um, how the children in the film felt about the process and or the the result, the the, the the final screening, I guess, or the, the yeah. screening. I mean, it, it was a really hard decision whether to put them in, whether to identify them. I mean, we're like, we're living in a, with the time, we're <laughs> living in Saskatchewan, you know, my little nephew plays hockey and at one of his hockey games, the one of the, the opposing team was like, I can't wait to do what Stanley did. You know, and, and saying this loud so everyone could hear. And my my cousin, Oskaya's mom, is, is a warrior. And she just, like, went up and got in the woman's face and was like, you're really going to say that? And, you, you know, I want you to look in my eye and say it. And went to the coach and complained and caught, you know, whatever. But that was the reality, right? So there was just this worry of, like, what's that going to do? And we we talked about it a long time. And ultimately, we both felt that, like whatever we can do to sort of shift this and call attention to this that we you know and we talked to the boys who were 11 at the time about how they felt and they were like no we want to do this um so yeah it wasn't an easy decision um and we filmed their scenes last that was the last thing we filmed um so you know and it was just thought of like what are the things what, what can we bring and you know i wanted to take them to the RCMP museum and I w you know these different things. Um, they often say what a great <coughs> summer it was. They knew the heaviness of what they were doing, but at the same time they were 11 and they loved the crew and they loved the travel and you know they they that part of it they really appreciated. Um, you know and they loved the family. You know they had they Auntie Jade and Uncle Lyle and you know they really got to know Debbie and and they thought a lot about Colton, and they, you know, they knew what they were doing, and they knew the importance of it. Um, you know, I think that for my son, it was just hard because I was had to be away, and it, it was it was just traumatic, like the process for the family and the and all of us. We were, you know, I'm not comparing to what the family went through or what we went through, but we also, you know, it was also really hard. And they would say that like. They would thank us all the time and ask if we were okay all the time because they would say we have we have no choice, we're in this. You you're choosing to be here with us, and you know we worry about you all. Um, so that was hard on the on my you know on my son in particular. Just the li you know living with and the edit process was really hard. You know you're just with it all the time, and that it, you know that was tough for us at home. But we had lots of support. Um, they feel really proud. Um, I'll say that we decided not to put their full names in the credits, and my nephew is still mad at me for that. Like he wanted his name. He, you know, he's like, "I'm proud of what I did," and you know, and we explained like that was a safety thing, you know, because we just didn't know. 
I mean, there were threats going around. There was all, like, you know, we didn't know. And we just thought, you know, and, and, and one of the things Bonnie and I taught when we, because we were, John came in just a little bit later than Bonnie, but it was that initial decision. And Bonnie did say to me, she goes, you know, the thing is, they're still little boys. And by the time the film comes out, and, you know, they're going to be teens and they're not. And it's true. That first year the film came out, we got recognized all the time. Like, we'd go somewhere and it, people would come and talk to us and want to meet the boys. That never happens now. They recognize me, but they don't really recognize the boys. So, you know. W but, it, but that, you know, and I think in the end it, it wasn't the worst of what we thought. But at the time we didn't know. You know, there was just so much hate out there that it was a real concern. And... Um, but yeah, they're proud of it. They're proud of what of their contribution to it. And you know, when we we brought the whole family, you know, uh, which is something you know, again, John said, you know, when Hot Dog said, "Oh, we want you guys to open the film," we're like, "Great!" And we're bringing like a group of twelve. So let's all figure out how we're paying for this because, you know, it's not just going to be me and one person on that stage, right? It's going to be all of us, and it was all of us, and it, we brought the boys. And, um, you know, they were, well, Skaya would have toured with us for, like, the re he loves the stage, he loves talking, he always thinks of something really profound to say. Um, my son did one stage, did hot docs, did, did, and I was, like, overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed, and he was my little rock. He was just, and he was like, Mom, look up at the upper balcony, they want to see that you can see them, too. And, you know, he's like, he was coaching me because I was just frozen up there. And, and then at that, and then after that, the next day was the next screening and he just was like, no, I'm good. And he's, like one other time he came up, but he, does, he doesn't like the public. Um, you know, but yeah, they know, they know what they've done. They know what they contributed and, and um, the family loves them for what, you know, for, for being a part of it. We have time for more. Uh, uh. I'll make this uh, short. I'll try to what do the same. <laughs> <laughs> One aspect, um, obviously, in the story is the decision of that jury, mm -hmm. which was horrifying. There was a whole situation of, obviously, defense and prosecution can dismiss preemptively prospective jurors. I've heard as well, I saw there's two questions. I heard as well, at the time, it was actually very hard to find indigenous candidates for jury selection. That was something I read in the press. I don't know if that's true or not. But my question, I guess a larger question really is, with um, the what changes actually were made in terms of jury selection process? And has that had any effect upon the process of trying to get a balanced jury, as it were? Yeah, Good no, question. there there were five. There were five visibly indigenous people who were in that first pool. Um, there was some controversy because they didn't, they were supposed to use a double blind process to choose the candidates, and they didn't. And there's also the issue that in Saskatchewan, um, they use health cards to choose jury. And Saskatchewan marks who's an Indian, Indian, on our status cards. Th they've changed that now. But at the time, you th they could have looked at the list and they knew. Uh, that said, there were still enough. There were, you know, there could have easily been five. They were all dismissed. Um, and, you know, I think that I haven't done it, like I haven't really looked up the sig so much. I know the use something, John followed that better. I think there was some concern that it could be used the other way to try and you know, um, exclude, you know, so th there's been some of that, but I think um, ultimately the hope is that, you know, at least the defense has to work a little bit if they're gonna try and remove, you know, indigenous people or people of color from a jury. Um, but yeah, John, you might wanna. Just a couple of things on that. On um, you know, if you are serving as a jury member, 
uh, the court, you know, the justice, the, the legal system, I should say, you know, puts you up. They take care of your transportation. If you get a summons, you're responsible for getting there yourself. So then what does that do in an area where you have disproportionate poverty levels that are based in hundreds of years of oppression? There are no bus lines, you know, it's minus 30. It's very, very difficult to kind of, for a lot of people to get there. So, you know, th that is a systemic thing that I do think needs to be contextualized. As Tasha said, you know, that wasn't the issue. You know, there were people there that were uh, challenged using those peremptory challenges. And nixing peremptory challenges is one thing, but that does not guarantee representation still. You know, you can remove peremptory challenges and still not have representation. So, you know, when you're in an area and that area is, you know, 45% We think it's 45, yeah. You know, that is, um, and the people that you are seeing are, you know, 100% non-Indigenous, there is massive problem there, right? Uh, and when we talk about a jury of our peers, uh, that's not what that is. You know, and I guess that's the thing. You know, we, we watched the jury the whole time, and, you know, there, there was one jury member who really s seemed to be understanding things, you know, and, and, because that was it, we just kept looking at them, like, are they gonna see past what the defense is doing? Are they going to be able to be critical of the narrative that he, like, it was thick. And they spent hours on how much they were, the youth had drank that day. Who cares? It actually doesn't really have anything to do with what Stanley did. You know what I mean? Like, it was just all, and it was hard to sit through. And we kept looking at the jury, like what are they, what are they taking in? And this one particular juror seemed to be, and and that's the juror that smiled, this beatific smile at Stanley, and we all went, oh, like we thought that, you know, do you know what I mean? And there was a video taken, <laughs> so so they, you c there was no room in the courthouse, so there was another room where people could watch the video feed. And somebody recorded, not supposed to, but somebody recorded what when those when they ran Stanley out of the room, literally ran him out, that that particular jury stood up and the fear on that person's face of the grief and the anger by the family, like they it was like the the people of Battleford barricading themselves in the fort. It was the same thing. And you know, those juries literally, f th they were running for their life. That's how they ran out of that courtroom, except for the two that stayed. And they were heartbroken. And we, we, think we thought about those two for a long time. They stayed and cried and cried and cried. Um, and we wonder what happened in that, in that room. If the prosecution does not object to things, the jury has to consider them, right? So, you know, and, and that was something that we were discussing earlier, but um, the prosecution has to object. It's like, well, what were they doing earlier? The prosecution has to get up and say, who cares? Unless it had to do with this young man getting shot, it is not relevant, and that's just not what happened. Yeah, no, there was, there, I would encourage if, if people are interested in the legal elements and the, there's a, a group of uh, scholars that uh, did analysis of dif the different elements of, of the situation, the case called Project Facta, and they have, it's available online, and there's, uh, there's an article about the jury issue, there's an article about trespass, there's a, it's, it's quite useful and we, you know, definitely helped us um, you know, think, think, think some of this stuff through. I think we put the, this online at Mass Academy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that people can check that out. Yeah, no, it's worth reading. So I wanted to uh, thank you. I also want to thank you for um, putting the family like this in, in such a prominent way. And, I, you know, I hope just my question was how are they doing now? And Natalie, can you yeah. use the microphone, please? Uh, how are they doing now? No, how, yeah, how the family's doing now. 
How are they doing now? You know, it. I think that it, it's still so, you know, the loss mm -hmm. never goes away. And, you know, that we put that line from Debbie, like, she knew this isn't, it's always going to be there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's definitely the case. You know, I think um, someone recently gifted them a portrait of him and, you know, for a long time they, they didn't put it up, but it's up now, you know. Um, I think that they're, you know, they're still supporting other families. One of the things we did, and it was through conversation with them, that they were like, these are, you know, people were coming to them. If they're, the, you know, families who have experienced colonial violence were coming to them and asking their, for their advice, and it was, they wanted to help, but it was also hard because they're yeah. still also dealing with their stuff. So we gathered together a group of lawyers and academics and spent time with the family to create a resource guide for families who've experienced colonial violence, and it's available on the film website. Um, and basically, we just said, what do you wish you'd known? And like, how do you lodge a complaint against the RCMP? Because the RCMP just gaslit them from the beginning with their complaint and their original investigation that they investigate themselves. Oh, there was no wrongdoing and they had to keep pushing and know that process, uh, how to deal with media. I mean, media showed up at their wake and funeral of, of Colton and were trying to push in and, you know, they were really, you know, heartbroken, it's not the time, you know, things like that, how to appoint a spokesperson, all of the different things, how, you know, most people, I think, don't realize that the prosecutor, I think we, we you know, watch a lot of Law and & Order and we think, oh, they're here for the people <laughs> or they're, they're here for us. No, no, they, they're here for the Crown. Mm -hmm. You know, they the prosecution represents the Crown. It's not the family of the victims. And in this case, they were hostile to the family. So, you know, all of these things mean, you know, they, they don't, they want to help other families. So, you know, they still do things like that. You know, they still speak to the issue. Um, you know, they, they're, they're trying their best to heal. And it, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's unimaginable, you know, having that, having to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tasha, for coming. We're so grateful that you were here in Toronto and could be with us this evening. And John, thank you very much for coming. The next uh, edition of this Filmmaker in Residence series of screenings is on December the 8th. It's a Thursday, and we're showing Unloved Huronia's Forgotten Children, which is directed by Barry Cohen. It's quite an extraordinary uh, documentary film, and I hope you'll come back for that. Thanks all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>